Coming up next, this band came out of nowhere to sell almost 16 million copies of their debut record. But at the peak of their fame during this period, they completely sabotaged their greatest song. After the album blew up, they hadn't even released the best song from the record, so the label was psyched knowing the song would push them further up the charts. But the band wanted nothing to do with this song being a hit. In fact, they did everything in their power to prevent it. Didn't really work. Find out why and the crazy story coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you have ever waited in line forever to get tickets to your favorite band back in the day before the internet, you're going to dig this channel. Make sure that you subscribe below right now to be a part of our Music History Daily. Get the story straight from the artists and click the bell so you don't miss out. Also, hit us up on Patreon. Your support there really helps us make more videos, do more interviews, all of that. Plus, you'll get access to additional uh, footage, catalog of content that you won't get here. So it's time for another edition of our series, The New Standards. So this is a show where we take an in-depth look at songs that have risen above genre, decade, and fads. Songs that have become essential entries into the great world songbook. On previous episodes, we've covered Ordinary World by Duran Duran, Hotel California by the Eagles, Pictures of You by The Cure, and so many more. Today, we're taking a deep dive into one of the most powerful and heart-wrenching anthems of the 1990s, Black by Pearl Jam. So the story of Black is tightly interwoven with the origins and initial rise of Pearl Jam. You know, after the dissolution of Seattle grunge pioneers Mother Love Bone in 1990, guitarist Stone Gossard teamed up with childhood friend Mike McCready and then former bandmate Jeff Ament to start a new project. The result of their efforts was a five-song collection that they called the Stone Gossard Demos. This now legendary tape of instrumental tracks found its way into the hands of San Diego singer Eddie Vedder. The music, of course, spoke to Vedder, so he wrote lyrics and recorded vocals for three of the tracks, Alive, Once, and Footsteps. He dubbed these the Mama's Son Trilogy and sent them off to Jeff and Men in Seattle. Now, when Ament and Gossard heard of Vedder's interpretation, they were transfixed, to say the least, and they immediately arranged an audition. Eddie arrived in Seattle on October 8, 1990, with the lyrics to a fourth track in hand, Black. Once there, he and the band, who had also added drummer Dave Krusen, uh, went straight to work. Kicking off one of the most grueling, week-long jam sessions in rock history, the heretofore nameless band laid down the musical foundations for their future album, 10. Just into this music writing clinic, the band recorded Black and nine other songs. However, these were all preliminary cuts. Pearl Jam wouldn't record 10 as we know it until the following spring. A month after 10's release, the Seattle rock floodgates were blown wide open with Nirvana's decade-altering album, Nevermind. But by January 11th, 1992, Smells Like Teen Spirit had ascended to number six on the Billboard Hot 100, and Nevermind had reached number one on the U.S. Billboard 200 album charts. Pearl Jam's first single, Alive, that climbed to number 16 on the U.S. mainstream rock chart. As we continue to break down this rock standard, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. You know, when you design your very own personalized frames at uh, zenny.com, you can add blue blocks as a feature for very little cost, and uh, that will protect your eyes from digital blue light from screens that we see every day. It's had an impact on me personally. I got to tell you, I used to get headaches all the time, and now I hardly ever have one since putting blocks on all of my frames. I have about 15 pairs. Check it out today at zenny.com. After early success, it seemed that Pearl Jam was just getting started. After completing their first European tour in March 92, the band flew to New York to tape an episode of MTV's Unplugged. Wants to. 
The set featured several songs from 10, including Oceans, Alive, Jeremy, Porch, Even Flow, and of course, Black. Pearl Jam Unplugged. Man, what can I say about this? It was a performance that was indelibly tattooed on the hearts of every coming of age Jan Axer. I think I've said it before, but when Eddie is sitting on the stool and you know, he takes off his hat and he shakes his head and you know, lets his hair fall down. And then goes into an emotional and moving rendition of Alive. For my generation, or at least for my circle of friends, it was akin to when the Beatles played Ed Sullivan. Oh, yeah, tell you something. It really was. Uh, that and Nirvana's Smells Like Teen Spirit. And I'm not comparing them to that moment per se. I'm just noting its historical significance in the culture of Gen X. Going back to Pearl Jam Unplugged for a minute, in addition to the innate power of the music itself, the show featured several other memorable moments. The conclusion of Black, where Eddie Vedder sings, We Belong Together, Together. Uh, we, we belong. Just a guy sitting on a stool, ripping his heart out, drowning emotionally, right there for all the world to see. We belong together, together. Eddie made us all feel something that day. The performance of Black was a spiritual awakening for a lot of us who were coming of age at that very moment. After the broadcast, letters to the band's fan club started just pouring in. Not surprising, a lot of them were about Black. And uh, many began in an eerily similar manner, something to the effect of, I was recently considering suicide and then I heard your music. Eddie Vedder actually answered many of these letters himself, often leaving the band's office a complete emotional wreck. For the band in general, and Eddie Vedder in particular, the weight of fame and notoriety was getting heavier and heavier, as you can imagine. It seemed like every time Pearl Jam reached some new plateau of success, there was another achievement already on the rise. Their second single, Even Flow, had peaked at number three on the US mainstream rock chart. <laughs> Clearly elated at their good fortune, Pearl Jam's label, Epic Records, started pushing the band harder to reach even greater commercial heights. But this intensity was starting to vex Eddie Vedder. He couldn't care less how many people bought 10. What he cared about was how closely people were listening to the music. It wasn't about selling records, concert tickets. It was about sharing art with the people. But perhaps the climactic uh, moment in Pearl Jam's Starcross saga came with the release of their third single, Jeremy, which reached number five on the rock charts in October of 1992. The music video, that premiered on MTV on August 1st and it quickly received the coveted heavy rotation slot. revolutionary for its day, really now even. Following year at one video of the year at the 1993 MTV Video Music Awards. When <laughs> Jeremy had catapulted Pearl Jam to an unprecedented level of unwanted fame. Now to illustrate just how out of hand things were getting, maybe a uh, quick story is in order here. I'll tell you, on one occasion, after the death of a friend, seven-year bitch guitarist Stephanie Sargent, Eddie Vedder needed to clear his head. You know, he wanted to, to grieve and process what had happened, so he headed out into nature where he found a deserted uh, coastal sand bluff. But it turns out he wouldn't be alone for very long. Just a short distance away, Eddie heard strange voices, yet somehow they also seemed familiar. Apparently, a group of Pearl Jam fans had gathered nearby and they started seeing black. Uh, Vetter was stunned and ultimately asked him not to sing the song. It seemed like there was no corner left in the world where Eddie Vetter could find a private moment. As incidents like this became more commonplace and pressures from the label increased, Pearl Jam started holding meetings to address uh, their escalating fame. They were seriously concerned about getting you know, too big too fast. It's a story we've heard a lot in the rock and roll lore. 
Yet after the larger-than-life success of Jeremy, record execs, they could smell the blood. And Black was in their crosshairs. It was the perfect candidate to be the next single. I mean, you think about it, this tear your heart out of your chest power ballad with Hot 100 crossover potential, it was gonna make him a lot of money. But Eddie Vedder and the rest of the band, they just weren't on the same page. They were tired of corporate coaching and the, the talk of becoming a super group. So Black was really where they drew the line. The song was just too special and fiercely personal to them. Some songs just aren't meant to be played between hit number two and hit number three, said Eddie. You start doing these things, you'll crush it. That's not why we wrote songs. We didn't write to make hits, but those fragile songs get crushed by the business. I don't want to be a part of it. I don't think the band wants to be a part of it. Contrast that perspective with what Sony Music CEO Tommy Mottola told Pearl Jam's manager Kelly Curtis. He warned that if the band didn't release Black as the next single, it would be the single biggest mistake he'd ever make in his life and career. I'll bet that Kelly Curtis could literally see the dollar signs in Mottola's eyes. But Pearl Jam, they held firm. They vowed not to support the release of Black as a single. And Vetter even called radio stations to make sure the label wasn't pushing it. As for the prospect of creating a music video, the over-the-top uh, hype of Jeremy, that had left a sour taste in his mouth. And Eddie Vetter believed that the emotional weight of the song, it would be destroyed if a video were made. I'm spinning. Oh, I'm According to Kelly Curtis, Eddie Vetter was just sick of seeing his own face everywhere. And that's when it all grounded to a halt. Said Curtis, it wasn't like we called up Epic and said, we're never doing a video again. It was more like, let's just stop everything now. Interviews, photo shoots, videos. There were some great people at the label that were really supportive. And then there were people that just didn't understand. Now, ironically, despite not being released as a single, Black still became a hit on the radio. Um, it debuted on the US mainstream rock chart on December 26th, 1992 and it peaked at number three three months later. And though Pearl Jam was told they'd never sell another record if they didn't do a video for Black, they of course went on to sell millions more. Yeah. Uh -huh. According to the RIAA, 10 has been certified platinum 13 times over. It also stayed on the Billboard 200 album chart for uh, I believe it was 264 weeks, which is over five years. Now, to put how big this album was and is in perspective, Nirvana's Nevermind, which is you know, the album that every historian or critic points to as the seminal moment of the 90s, it sold 10 million copies. Pearl Jam 10 has sold 3 million more copies in less time. I think that 10 has a, a more classic rock feel and influence to it, and it pulled in more rock and metal fans. That's just my take. Since 10, though, Pearl Jam has released an additional 10 studio albums and to this day remains one of the most influential bands from the 90s and continues to, to make great music. Eddie's got a new solo album out right now. So why was Black so special? Well, first of all, it was personal. Now, speaking from experience, Vedder said it's a song about first relationships. The song is about letting go, he said. It's very rare for a relationship to withstand the Earth's gravitational pull and where it's going to take people and how they're gonna grow. I've heard it said that you can't really have a true love unless it was a love unrequited. It's a harsh one because then your truest one is the one that you can't have forever. It's really great. It's a tragic sentiment, fit for a tragic song. But whether you're buying the idea that true love is always out of reach or not, it's certainly easier to sympathize with the thoughts after listening to Black really in depth. Jeff Amen observed that Black for Eddie was about putting feelings into words that he'd never expressed before. It was about coming to grips with loss and loneliness. Vetter also said that Black was one of a few songs he had to sing from a place of deep, deep emotion. Performing it had nothing to do with melody or timing or even the words. It was all about the emotion behind the song. 
There was no going halfway with Black. Every time he sang it, it was guaranteed to tear him up inside. I dare you to sing Black and not feel it, is what he said. I dare you. You gotta feel it. It's gotta be the real deal. That's part of the curse. If you're gonna play the song, you better play it. I've tried to phone in Jeremy a few times and it's tough. It doesn't work. And it clearly doesn't work to phone in Black either. You got to give it all you got or you've got nothing. And for us as listeners, pretty much the same, right? If you aren't wondering if the sun will ever shine again after listening to Black, you haven't really heard it. Uh, in Black, all the lights go out. There is no warmth. There is only the realization that the one shining star above your world is gone forever. And it now hovers in somebody else's sky even more. I know someday you'll have a beautiful life. I know someday you'll have a beautiful life. I know you'll be a star in somebody else's sky, but why? Why can't it be mine? I mean, many of us have experienced this song firsthand uh, for the first time we did as either teenagers or young adults. From that perspective, Black is an amazing story about the first brushes with love and how for many of us it all went wrong. But as you listen to it decades down the road, the message somehow deepens and it just becomes even more poignant. As each of us think back on lovers lost and what could have been, it can become a seriously excruciating exercise, torturous even. With added experience and a longer checklist of regrets, Black has the power to saturate your soul with unrelenting melancholy and grief. Somehow it makes you want to both forget and never forget that someone that mattered more than anything. There are definitely a wide variety of interpretations of what this song really means. So maybe you have some other ideas. Tell me in the comments if you do. But for me, it's all about experiencing loss. It's about watching something that you thought would last. Just slip out of reach. Realizing that it's, it's gone for good. And yet somehow black, it's also amazingly cathartic. It has the power to take me to a place of complete and utter deprivation. But in the midst of its dark beauty, I can also feel something like many of those kids who you know, wrote to Eddie Vedder might have felt. It was thinking about throwing it all away, but then I heard your song. There's something about black that has the, the power to save lives. It's so achingly real. Just the act of embracing it somehow makes it possible to carry on. It is absolutely pure, perfect poetry. And that, my friends, is why Eddie Vedder could not sell this song to the, the gods of the mighty dollar. The this song got me through a heart-wrenching breakup when I was a teenager. I actually walked in on my girlfriend and another guy hooking up. I was like 16. Back then, I was a hopeless romantic with endless optimism of what love can do, what love means. Well, my air supply version of love quickly turned into the Smiths and the Cure when I really experienced it, and it changed me. Black was a song that kept me from walking off the cliff, as they say. Eddie Vedder described my thoughts with pinpoint accuracy, and I was able to emote and lament and finally let go because of this song. I was able to truly grieve the loss of something that I thought was precious and everlasting, and I gained a lot of perspective. And I know now that I'm no different than thousands of other teenagers who at the same time felt these things, these exact things, these feelings while listening to Black, and that's why this song is a touchstone of Generation X, a, a new standard. <laughs> For me, all the pictures in my mind from that time have all been washed in black, tattooed everything. In black, tattooed everything. Leave us a comment about Pearl Jam and 
this uh, bittersweet song about coping with this unbearable loss. What are your memories of Black? I would love to hear about what this song means to you. Have a great discussion in the comments. Um, if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to check out our other shows on the 90s Seattle scene. Covered Alive by Pearl Jam, Say Hello to Heaven by Temple of the Dog, uh, also Rooster by Alice in Chains. Tell us what else you'd like to see. Don't forget to subscribe. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Talk to you soon.